with all the repetitions, the 14 choruses and cranking up the volume. Gathering is a lot harder than getting yourself to a pulpit service for an hour each week. Alistair Begg, the senior pastor of Cleveland's Parkside Church, recently spoke at the Sing Conference. And according to an article in the Christian Post, he called for a return to serious engagement with the Bible where the focus is less on inspirational talks and more on the expositional preaching. Preaching that seeks to unfold the meaning of the text, not just offer uplifting or therapeutic messages. Amen to that. He also said that the pulpit once stood as a monumental symbol of spiritual authority, but that the symbol has all but faded, making way for a more casual and consumer-friendly approach to worship spaces. Yes, but the pulpit is the problem, and I'm gonna tell you why. Welcome to Morning Tea. Hi, I'm Joanne Jolene. It's great to have you here today. Dictionary definition of a pulpit, a raised platform or enclosed structure in a church from which a preacher or clergy member delivers a sermon or addresses the congregation. The first assemblies of believers for probably the first couple of centuries had no such thing. The gatherings were centered inward, toward each other, and there was a very specific purpose stated, and that was edification, to lift each other up, to encourage each other, to strengthen each other, to help each other grow in the faith. I've often heard it called one anothering, and I really love that. Today, people sit in a theater-like arrangement of rows, focusing forward toward an elevated speaker. And at these pulpit services, there are brief encounters with people as they move into their seats and then they move out at the conclusion. But people are starving for the real community that is supposed to be taking place, that used to take place, and too many have had enough and they've left. We know that half the population of the U.S. who claim to have faith or a belief in God have left organized churches, and I call them believers. Um, these are people who have decided to go it alone, and sadly, it only works for a little while, and then there will be drift, spiritual drift. And I talk about this all the time. As a lifelong sailor, drift is a part of the very nature of moving toward a destination. We've got the tides, the currents, and even the power of the wind, which is that driving force moving you forward. It's constantly working against you and subtly pushing you off your charted course. So without the proper knowledge and the maps and the guides and the reliable navigation tools, you're going to get lost. And then you run the risk of running into hazards and even becoming shipwrecked. So abandoning the current church pulpit model is not the answer. Um, it could be for a short time just to get yourself reset spiritually, but finding a small group or a home church somewhere without a pulpit is what is needed. It's what we all must have in order to be able to navigate that open sea and the inevitable rough waters that are coming. It caught my attention when he discussed music. Why is it so hard in many cases to get people to sing? The poor people up here, they've got to be here one hour early in order to get themselves all jazzed up. So in the hope that they can get us all jazzed up. And if we don't get jazzed up immediately, then we're going to sing it again. And we'll keep singing it until you're jazzed up. And we'll repeat the chorus 14 times and we'll make sure that we're finally there. What's the problem? Spiritual deadness is the problem, he lamented. No, I don't think that's the problem. I think it's the idea that music is supposed to somehow stimulate us into an emotional state with all the repetitions, the 14 choruses and cranking up the volume. Music was not even a big part of the early assemblies at all. Singing a bit, but musical instruments are not even mentioned. They may be inferred since they sang psalms which have some direction for specific instruments and melodies. Actually, there is a direct reference to instruments where Paul calls them lifeless things that make sounds. And that's not a vote of confidence for the rock bands on the church stages. And just so I don't get upset emails about music that has personally blessed and encouraged you, I'm a musician, I would never judge the musical expression uh, of any genre that emanates from a musician with a heart of praise and thanksgiving in spirit and truth for the glory of God. So a little bit about one anothering. Um, these each other phrases occur about 59 times. It's very important. This is an activity that you are doing to someone else. You can't do this all by yourself. And one anothering is a lot harder than getting yourself to a pulpit service for an hour each week. You have to actually engage personally with people of all kinds. This is where we put into practice the love, the forgiveness, the patience, the kindness. You know, it's a lovely thing to have a peaceful and quiet meditation where thinking about the words of God, we're feeling the Holy Spirit speak to us. We can go for a walk through the cathedrals of God's amazing creation or out on the ocean as I like to do. 
but we have to get back to the work of each other, accept one another, be at peace with each other, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. When you come together to eat, wait for each other. Don't grumble against each other. Let's not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. And the most repeated one is love one another deeply from the heart. Pretty much everyone knows 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter, right? Love is patient, love is kind, and so on. It's a favorite at weddings for the new couple. But those words are part of a discourse on how believers should behave to each other. Leading into that love chapter is number 12, which talks about diversity and unity in the body of Christ. And then after it, chapter 14, it goes into specifics on how to keep order in those gatherings. So in the workings of the community and the gatherings is where we must show the patience and the love and the kindness. And we don't envy and we don't boast and we don't easily get anger and all the rest of it, which is what brings the unity to the diverse body of believers. So here's my encouragement. In your small group, this is where you're going to practice your one anothering command. Here's one. In humility, consider others more significant than yourselves. And this really goes against our natural grain to consider ordinary other people better than ourselves. It really takes practice. But practically speaking, we learn this in coaching, and here's how you do it. They speak. So you restrain yourself from launching into your own opinion, but you turn it back to them and you acknowledge their thoughts and the words they spoke, and you expound upon what they have said. Something like, yes, I hear you, I hear what you say. I especially like that point you made about such and such. Can you tell me more about that? And then you draw them out and you validate what they think, which is who we are, isn't it? It's our thoughts that are coming from our hearts. Um, and if you're not in the practice of considering others as more important than yourself, then you may be surprised at the impact on yourself when you put this into practice. So love one another. Thanks for watching. Have a wonderful and blessed week, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.